All right, we are live. Welcome to Sasquatch Out of the Shadows Live. I'm your host, Alex Petikov. Thank you guys all for joining. In case you missed last week's show, we had a great conversation with Ken Gearhart. You can watch that or any of the other episodes on the channel, uh, such as the other documentaries I've done. And just remember to subscribe if you like this kind of content, just to help support us. Uh, next week, we are having on Seth Breedlove of Small Town Monsters. We're going to talk filmmaking and a lot of the interesting projects that they've been up to. Uh, as for this show, we're really excited to have Lauren Coleman on. So Lauren Coleman is a living legend in the cryptozoology world. He's one of the world's most foremost cryptozoologists. He's been involved in the subject since the 1960s at least, and has pretty much covered everything from Sasquatch to Lake Monsters, Mothman, everything in between, you name it. Uh, he's authored dozens of books, contributed to dozens of books and, and journals, and has been featured on countless documentaries, TV programs, news segments. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit of those later. Uh, but Lauren, in 2003, founded the International Cryptozoology Museum, which is a one-of-a-kind destination uh, museum dedicated wholly to cryptozoology and the unknown more broadly. Uh, so we're going to do something a little bit differently today for the show. Uh, since the museum, like many small businesses, is closed down due to the pandemic, we're going to be doing some fundraising through the Super Chat option. So if you do have a question or comment for Lauren, if you could spare a few dollars there's the dollar icon in the youtube chat in the live chat and you can just leave your desired amount alternatively there's a link in the description below where you can donate directly to the museum and 100 percent of those profits will go to helping out the museum in this time so without further ado let's bring in lauren coleman how you doing lauren hey how are you doing excellent it's it's an honor to have you on first of all uh you're somebody that probably as, as far back as I can remember, I was reading some of your books and, and watching you on TV as a, as a kid. So this really, to me, is is an honor to have, you know, befriended you and now have you on the show. And it's just been, uh, it's been a dream come true. Well, thank you. And I'm still alive. So that's always good. <laughs> there we go. That's what's important. So, uh, First of all, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, very storied background, and how you originally got into cryptozoology? Sure. Well, um, I'm one of those guys that was born in the wake of World War II. My father was in the Navy. I got born in Norfolk and left there very early and grew up in Illinois. Uh, in 1960, when I was 11 years old, I saw a Japanese film called Half Human, and it raised a lot of questions in my mind. It was about the abominable snowman, yet he's in a Himalayan-like surrounding. And I was one of those students that I loved my teachers, they loved me. I was very much into science, into drawing uh, insects and, and natural history. I had my own um, zoo in my backyard and would go on many expeditions uh, with my uh, brothers and the neighborhood kids. And I wondered what these yetis were because uh, nobody could tell me. And I went to school and uh, I had some teachers and they said, you know, they gave me three answers. Uh, they don't exist. Get back to your studies. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. I went to the library and I was a, a frequent library user and I found out all about uh, cryptozoology, although in 1960 it wasn't called cryptozoology yet. It was called romantic zoology. Yeah. And I started uh, getting a few books and I would go through the books in a very systematic way and write everybody that was a you know proper name of a author, a scientist, a, a person that was a researcher. And before you knew it, I had John Keel, uh, Ivan Sanderson, Bernard Heuvelmans, all of these correspondents. And I also started doing expeditions, literally. Um, hooking up with local game wardens, looking into Black Panther reports, uh, going all over Illinois. Uh, then I went to uh, college and majored in anthropology and zoology. And I, I have to say I wasn't in school too often because I was <laughs> hitchhiking all over the Midwest and all over the South, investigating cases, writing them up, 
corresponding with people, so much so that when I went to my first conference in 1973, I, I was giving a presentation on uh, Tom Slick and the Yeti and different things. And I walked in and the head of the conference said, oh my gosh, we thought you were 40 years old or so because you've been <laughs> in the field for so long. So uh, I just kept doing that and I moved to California for a while, moved to New England, um, started writing books, went to Loch Ness, went to Mexico, Canada, you know, just started expanding my world. And, uh, and every place that I went, I would collect artifacts, uh, roadside art, souvenirs, um, different pieces of cryptozoology that were three-dimensional. Right. So much so that finally in 2003, uh, I'd build my house so full. I mean, you can see this isn't cryptozoological, but I have a kind of a museum mentality. Uh, as somebody once said, or I once said to them, I had the choice in the uh, early 2000s to uh, really embrace that part of me that liked to collect things. And I had to make a decision. Did I want to become a hoarder or a museum director? And so I decided to go for the <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I opened the museum in 2003. We soon became a 501c3 a nonprofit. We have a board and, you know, one thing's led to another, but it's it's just been a legacy that uh, I could not have ever uh, imagined. Uh, but I just kept doing what I wanted to do passionately, uh, very scientifically, and always writing, you know, writing blogs, writing articles, writing books, uh, so much so that I've been associated now with 103 books that I've either uh, authored or co-authored or did uh, forwards to. And it's just, a, it's been a wonderful, wonderful life, actually. Absolutely. I've, I've got a whole stack of your books here. And this is one, you did mention Tom Slick. Now this yeah. is this is the uh, true life encounters uh, in cryptozoology that you've written. And fantastic book if anybody wants to learn more about Tom Slick and the sort of early days of the of the Sasquatch and the Yeti sort of classic expeditions. Um, you've been a mainstay of cryptozoology for such a long time. I mean, I remember even as a kid just when I would think cryptozoology, I would think, oh, that guy on TV with the beard. That was that was my association. So it looks like we already have one contribution from Tim R. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so a question of mine, given that you've had such a storied history with cryptozoology, is is there a favorite place you've traveled to in search of cryptids? I know that's a tough one, but. Well, you know, for a long time, I used to talk about in 1999, I was invited to become the mission cryptozoologist uh, for Don S uh, Scott Taylor's expedition to Loch Ness. Uh, and I, um, he set up the expedition and actually uh, had uh, decided to take his submarine down into Loch Ness and I was going to be in that submarine. Unfortunately, Dan, uh, I called him Don, I meant Dan, had had a news conference in the Carolinas. And one of the first things he did was say he was going to catch up with the Loch Ness Monster, stab it with a harpoon to get a DNA sample. The next day, uh, Scotland withdrew all his permits. And uh. he couldn't go, but I could go. And I, I had my flights that I was going to take, and I did take my son Malcolm and my son Caleb with me. Uh, I went over there, I gave the first presentation at the International Cryptozoology Conference uh, Symposium uh, and interviewed like 35 different people on the lock, spent two weeks there, traveled all over uh, and had a really great time. And I always talked about that as the epicenter of cryptozoology because it, they had two museums within a, a block of each other. Everybody was cryptozoology friendly. Uh, there was no uh, debunking or skeptics. I, I got to talk to, uh, had tea with Adrian Shine, uh, met Robert Rhines there, talked to, uh, Ale I think his name was Alex Campbell, 
one of the old, old uh, men uh, that had been eyewitness. And it was wonderful. But the one thing that was really kind of shaking me was when I came back, I talked to Dan and he said, well, you know, I'm kind of glad uh, glad you, it didn't all happen because the last time I went down in the lock, I had to have an umbrella because I could never get the hatch closed. So <laughs> he le it leaked. And uh -oh. Growing up in Illinois, even though my father was in the Navy, I never learned how to swim. So, wow. So I was kind of glad <laughs> for that. That's great. Uh, Loch Ness is a fantastic place. And that's one oh, of yeah. my first places that I went to sort of when I kind of became more involved in cryptozoology and more than an armchair researcher sense. Um, but given this channel is uh, the primary focus here, at least is Sasquatch. Uh, obviously, I've done stuff on other topics, but Sasquatch is, is the theme. And we know that's one of the more popular cryptids. You have some pretty fantastic books. One of them is... Um, Bigfoot, the true story of apes in America. So could you talk maybe a little bit about your first experience, I suppose, with Sasquatch or North American apes in that context or what led you on that path? Well, uh, the first book that I really ever read, uh, I mean, there's lots of books that, on romantic zoology that I read uh, in 1960. Um, but then in 61, Ivan Sanderson's book came out. And I just devoured it. And I've devoured it several times. And in fact, uh, I got together with uh, Cosmos to write a new introduction, came out with a new edition. But in 1960, I started reading it. And um, what really appealed to me in there was these cases in the bottomlands of North America, of Eastern North America and the South, uh, of these little apes of the woods. And I went all over the South and all over the Midwest investigating those cases. And so uh, in 1962, I found actual footprint that looks like uh, an ape foot, uh, a series of them in a creek near um, in Decatur near Stevens Creek. And I also went all over the South and the Rick Rainbow uh, situation at Enfield, which Today it's called the infield monster, but back then it was just an ape-like creature. And so I, I very much got involved in some of those, uh, went down to Mississippi, investigated some of those, went to Florida very early on in my career to investigate the skunk ape reports. Right. Uh, talked to the Mormons at the desert uh, ranch down there, found out cases from the 40s. So. That all happened, and then I went to California uh, because actually uh, when I was in uh, California early in my uh, life uh, in the 1970s, I had gone up to Willow Creek and met Al Hodgson, Hodgson and uh, a lot of those people. And then I went across Canada, stopping all along the way investigating uh, in every province, province there. Um, so one of the things about that book and my other book, The Field Guide to Bigfoot, is I really felt very personally involved uh, with uh, the Bigfoot cases. And since I originally, you know, they talk about first love, my first love was the Yeti because that's what really pulled me into cryptozoology. Uh, I almost had an opportunity to uh, go to um, Nepal on an expedition, but, uh, and I planned this out for a year. And then I don't know how it happened, but my second wife, and she was going to have my son, my first son, right at the same time that I was supposed to go to Nepal. So I decided to stay home and be in the operate, in the, you know, delivery room and all of that. So sometimes, I've made some choices based upon family, but cryptozoology usually wins out. <laughs> that's amazing. And that's that's so interesting. Uh, the Yeti was the first thing that got me interested in the subject as well. So I, I really can can sympathize with that. Um, we'll, we'll start. We'll take a couple questions here from the yeah. audience. Uh, we have one from Rick. Have you ever come across a single print or a trackway that suddenly stopped? What happened to the rest of the prints? 
the tracks that I've found that are one or two usually stop because they're in a creek bed and there's vegetation on each side. I understand where this is going with regard to yeah. a lot of people feel like in the snow, then all of a sudden, like the Bigfoot or, or something dematerialized right. or disappeared to, to another dimension. I, I respect people that, that need to believe in that or feel that, but my experience personally is there a biological basis to Bigfoot and all the tracks that I've found have been, uh, they disappear because of environmental reasons. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely uh, interesting. I, I had a feeling that's where the question was going. But, you know, for the sake of it, I figured it's uh, important to address that kind of stuff. Sure. So here's another good one. Um, please ask Lauren if he thinks that the Yeti are also a forest dweller like Sasquatch. And that's from David Clark. Obviously, a lot of people just picture the Yeti being solely up in a snowy Himalayan peak. So um, what do you think about that? Well, that's an early thing that I, I tried to really get to the bottom of for my readers is that um, Yeti actually live in montane forests. They live in the mountain valleys and in the forest. And the only reason that the tracks were found by some of the early mountain climbers is because they're going from one valley to another and they're going over the mountains. They also aren't white. Um, the indigenous peoples, the native peoples, the peoples from that country, those countries talk about them as black, red, brown, and brown. And that white is very much an American invention that was reinforced by the bumble yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So that's, that's something that I've always had to, to really talk about is that yetis aren't white. Uh, there may be a few older ones. Yes, that's actually I consulted to. Uh, I was going to say, yeah. Expedition Everest, and uh, they still didn't. They wanted to do it whatever color that Americans think that they are. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's so interesting. I mean, I know you've obviously talked about that a lot. It's just the that constant conception, and then I think Star Wars as well with the uh, their, their version kind of reinforced the white yeti a little bit as well. And and with horns. Yeah, and with the horns, and you see that in so many other depictions. I think recently the one of the animated movies, it wasn't by Pixar, but maybe another studio that did a Yeti sort of uh, little foot, I think it was, and of course right. Yeti with the horns as well. Right. So this is a really good question from Crash Course Cryptozoology. Carrick always asking some pretty, uh, pretty great questions here. What does Lauren think of the contrast between the Shipton and Cronin Yeti tracks? Very good question. Thanks, Carrick. Well, I, th I think that uh, actually they're a lot more alike than most people think. And I really want to take my cap off, if I was wearing it, to uh, Jeff Meldrum. I think his reconstruction of the Shipton cast, uh, something that I always instinctively uh, felt when looking at the Shipton cast, that the back end of the cast is really, uh, and it takes into account the fact that there was melt out. It's a much narrower foot, very much like the Cronin foot. And I think that uh, both of them are like that. The Cronin uh, track actually has the, um, the hallux a little closer to the, to the rest of the print, but I think that there's some similarities there if you think about the foot being more extended in the Shipton print. Absolutely. Uh, very interesting. Both obviously very interesting tracks. Uh, here's another one from a regular contributor, Guy15. Out of all of the cryptids you've researched, which ones do you 100% believe in? Well, I have to back up and talk, yeah. about, talk about the word believe. I do not believe in any of these cryptids. Belief is the providence of religion. Belief is when someone uses that word, they immediately are in a faith-based frame of reference. I feel scientifically in the world of cryptozoology, we have to be very careful. I actually investigate piecemeal psychosocials on people, yep. on the data, and I actually accept or deny 
uh, every little piece of evidence. I find that if I go on expeditions or even go for a walk in the woods looking for signs with somebody, uh, there's two kinds of people that I very much uh, am cautious around. True believers, because every noise they hear is encrypted. Right. It's a Bigfoot. It's a you know Sasquatch. It's a Mothman in the trees. <laughs> if they hear something and they don't understand it, their belief system immediately makes them uh, presume that that's something unknown. The other people, of course, are the strong capital S skeptics or debunkers, right. where everything that they hear or every piece of evidence that may uh, cause some kind of, I don't know what this is, they would immediately be able to explain it. And so it's the kind of excluded middle that I like to stay in, in touch with. The open-minded skepticism is the way to go with any investigation because there's usually something there. 10, 20% of the cases that I investigate, I have to come away and say there's probably good evidence there, but I just don't know what it was. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's even something I've noticed just in my fraction of a time interested in this field as compared to you, that there does seem to be sort of extremes, yeah. extremes on both ends. And I think the truth is usually somewhere in the middle, as they say. Yeah. So we have a $10 contribution from Robert Baker. Thank you very much. And I just want to state that this show is not in any way um, a gossip channel. We get some comments in here, people always fanning flames. I mean, that's just common. Um, but this question is, what is your opinion on David Politis and his missing 411 work? And again, this show is not um, you know, intended to be attacking anyone or whatever, but that's uh, from Robert. So, uh, And it's not... <laughs> And it will not be based upon his contribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I've had trouble with David. Uh, I think he he has a very strong personality that uh, very early on when he got involved in this field, he um, said some very nasty things about a lot of people. And I just soon don't like to say nasty things and don't like to compliment people that say nasty things. Uh, I have been somewhat um, skeptical and dubious of some of the 411 material, not so much uh, because of his personality, which there's lots of strong personalities in the field. But I've heard from some people that have talked about uh, specific cases in the books that weren't followed up, that a person had missed, been missing, that their body was found, that there wasn't anything Bigfoot related to it. There wasn't anything mysterious or uh, unexplained or supernatural. It just was a missing person. And yep. apparently uh, he has oftentimes excluded uh, the, the final resolution of some of those missing people uh, from his book. And some of the relatives and survivors have been very hurt and upset. And I just as soon stay away from uh, hurting people in which they know that their loved one went missing, was found, and they're trying to uh, mourn their death. Absolutely. I think that's unfortunate when that sort of thing happens. I mean, you try to play nice, but some people just don't seem to want to. Um, just one little footnote. I don't want to open a can of worms here, but I believe that uh, David and M.K. Davis and Bobby Short and a lot of other people are into this uh, Bluff Creek Massacre uh, hoax and claims, and I find that unfortunate. I tried to put it to bed in 2008 with an article in a magazine. Uh, John Green and I did a lot of work on showing the pictures were uh, changed around with uh, Photoshopping hue. You know, you can change the right. color by doing some of that stuff. And uh, now John Green's dead, Bob Titmus is dead, Renee DeHinden's dead, all of those people that were there in 1967, except for Bob Gimlin, are, are mostly dead. And uh, and all of a sudden there's some new person involved in this and, and making a new buck off of 
uh, a claim that really is is uh, almost libelous to Bob Gimlin. So, yeah, I, I have been inundated with comments from s certain people that believe in this theory, and there's some I've gotten even in here, and I just choose to kind of ignore it. So I'm I'm glad you you address that because. I just, I don't even like to give people attention when they bring those kind of ideas up. And I think a lot of people just can't understand that there is, people are making money off of fanning flames of controversy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we try to keep it as, as wholesome as we can in terms of what we're talking about. Now, this is a fantastic question from Jordan Warner, my friend here. He says, what is Lauren's opinion of the Sandra Mancy 1977 photograph? Champ, something near and dear to my heart. And you were obviously involved pretty heavily in, in Champ in that time. So uh, take the floor. Um, well, I, uh, I investigated that. I interviewed her. I was there at the first uh, symposium. I uh, talked to her. I, I knew Zarzinski, who actually discovered the yep. uh, the negative through San, Sandra. And uh, and I my opinion is important, sure, but I really was struck by some of the opinions of those early scientists that studied it and. Uh, and some of the early documentaries talked about her photograph being one of the best pieces of evidence for lake monsters in the world, even better than all of the Loch Ness monster photographs, which have a dubious history. Yeah. Um, but I think that uh, her very relaxed feeling about it, not really wanting to make money, not wanting to make a big deal, kept keeping it in her drawer for three years in which everybody in her family called it uh, the 300 pound duck. That's right. Yeah. It was just kind of excluded from her mind as being important. And uh, I, yet I think that it's a pretty remarkable photograph and a, a solid piece of evidence for Chan. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. And I had the, the great fortune of being one of the last people to interview her while she was still alive a few years ago. And um, I was just struck by her story. I mean, you hear it so many times on TV or, or read about it, but it's another thing to actually talk to the person and really uh, try and relive what they talked about. And you, of course, had uh, spoken to her fairly shortly after this had occurred. So um, it's yeah, just amazing. Yeah. And then I saw her many times. I went to uh over there once with the Japanese expedition and some other times. So it was, uh, she was very accessible um, and, you know, tried very hard to find the original photograph and all of that. So, uh, and, and I mean, not so much the original photographic site. Yes, right. Was the big quest uh, because it was, it wasn't something that uh, was remarkable, you know, that, that's kind of one of the pieces of evidence to me that she wasn't trying to pull a lot over, you know, the wool over people's eyes. Absolutely. And you were present, of course, at the, uh, the champ conference sort of symposium that took place. Yeah. Uh, great. I read, uh, Jerry, uh, uh Gary Man Mangia Coper's book on the subject. I think it's a interesting recap of that conference and I'm, it's unfortunate there hasn't been something similar. I, I'd love there to be another champ sort of symposium. Maybe that'll happen at some point. Yeah, that would be a good idea. I mean, it was a interesting time with, um, you know, all of those. Roy Mako was there and yep. Greenwell and Sandra and Sarzinski and I was there. It was just a, an amazing time back then. And, um, you know, we'll never be able to return there. But uh, I loved Gary's book and I'm, was very happy that he would take the effort to put that together. Yeah, absolutely. That was crucial for me, just learning about, you know, sort of the history of the champ subject. I think it's an integral part of it. Um, here's, a, here's one from Chris Angler. After all this years of research, do you consider yourself fulfilled in the field? And if not, what would it take? <laughs> well, actually, uh, I really feel every day I learn something new. I feel full of passion and feel that the pursuit is never done. Uh, yeah. I've always said that if I ever retired, I would die. You know, I just don't feel that uh, I'm ever going to feel fulfilled. Uh, even if Bigfoot is just, I've often said that the, uh, what I call the celebrity cryptids, Yeti, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, Champ, uh, some of those things probably are the ones who will be least uh, 
least possible to get discovered. And that, you know, the, um, the beach twails and the, the new orangutan or the new monkey or the new mammal, those are exciting to me, all the animals that are still being discovered. And, uh, you know, the, a songbird that was discovered brand new in Central Park, New York a few years ago, or a, a little turtle in the Pearl River, Mississippi. Those are as exciting to me as uh, Bigfoot being discovered, even though, of course, um, you know, Bigfoot being discovered would be wonderful. It's just uh, so many people want that to happen. It's kind of like, uh, uh, I almost feel like anthropologists, zoologists will require such high levels of proof uh, it'll take, even if somebody came forth with a body and a film and all of that, it'll be questioned for years and years, just like the Patterson film has been questioned. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I won't be fulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a great answer. And yeah, I think so many of these cryptids get overlooked uh, because of, like you said, the celebrities all the other discoveries, I mean, even just myself with uh, Lions of the East, just looking into the stories of mountain lions and mystery big cats, how often that's not even considered by a lot of people to be really a part of cryptozoology when it absolutely is. Yeah, actually, uh, in a lot of my lectures, I often say that uh, everybody's interested in Bigfoot. I'm very interested in Bigfoot, but more sightings happen of mystery cats than Bigfoot. And a lot of people... Uh, if you go around the rural areas of this country, they often will look at you whenever you start asking about the big cats, the Black Panthers, the, uh, the African lions that are seen throughout this country, because they take it for granted that these animals already actually exist, and they don't think of them as cryptids, but they very much so are. And uh, I think they're very exciting. I mean, the whole idea that Panthera atrax, the, the Ice Age uh, lion, might be behind some of these reports for me uh, is in a very interesting theory. Absolutely. We have a fantastic $50 contribution here from Paul Gagne, who says, the idea of Bigfoot was ironically both terrifying and comforting to me as a child. Thank you for applying critical thinking and science to the stuff of my dreams and being a vehicle for my continued wondering as an adult. Well, thank you, Paul, for the donation and for your consideration of my genius. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people would would probably share sentiment with Paul there. Yes, that was very nice of Paul to say all of that. Uh, you know, uh, I think that I would be untrue to myself if I didn't try to critically think every thing I say about Bigfoot, every investigation, every eyewitness, I... I uh, interview because I feel like I owe it to the field. I owe it to cryptozoology to be as you know rigid in my thinking as I can. I, I find it you know somewhat discouraging that sometimes the field drifts into sensationalism. Right, and that really is disappointing. It is, and I think. Uh... As the world drifts into that, I think so uh, So do subjects like cryptozoology, unfortunately. But we have to stay true, as you said. And, and I think you've set a great example for everybody um, coming forward, certainly for myself and for many others I've spoken to. You've obviously been sort of uh, something to aspire to, to be like. Um, so here's a question from the Scottish wild man. What's the craziest experience you've had out in the field? Well, you know, I've always said I'm never really afraid when I go out in the field, but the, the one thing that does scare me and is kind of the craziest experiences are the people I meet. And uh, there was a time when I was all by myself in the uh, TNT area. Oh, yeah. Down in the Mothman area. And I ran into these three people in a pickup truck who were obviously poaching. Yeah, wow. And I was very scared for my life uh, because I was all by myself. I was actually had just fallen waist deep into water uh, in, in the back area. And I was just 
quietly trying to get back to my four wheel vehicle, four wheel drive vehicle. And uh, these guys were kind of, they weren't wearing orange. They had guns <laughs> and they had a pickup truck. And uh, I was just happy to not be. So that may not make the person who answered the question real happy, but that's, I'm much more uh, aware of the craziness of people when I'm out there than the creatures. Absolutely. That, that's a, that's a very scary area. First of all, the, yeah. the TNT area, but that's something I think people lose sight of. You know, you, people talk about experiencing something with a cryptid, but when I'm out in the woods, I mean, regardless uh, if it's just hiking or anything, I'm, I'm obviously more concerned about what people will do than, than a moose or a bear or any type of animal. So I, I can totally understand your concern. Uh, I do have one pretty cool comment from, well, it's a question actually, but Daniel Fernandez, he's viewing from Brazil, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. He says, even if we take into consideration Sasquatches are shy and stealthy creatures, shouldn't we be getting more videos and, and of better quality of them with the technology we have available nowadays? Thank you for the question, Daniel. Uh, actually, I've always uh, I, I've seen a real decline in good videos. Uh, for one thing, uh, cell phones are not great with video. Uh, right. The technology is there. People certainly could use it. They could stabilize their videos, stuff like that. But um, what we often find is if you think about it, and I did this uh, on my blog once, I said to people, we know that there's white and melanistic squirrels out there. Send me a picture of one in your neighborhood. <laughs> and nobody, you know, even though they're in some of the zoos and some of the colleges and different, nobody could send me one. Uh, if you think about the time it takes to get out your camera, get out your phone, the Bigfoot's already gone. Uh, that's one part of it. The other is, uh, um, it's just much better to have film. And so Patterson film is very good for us because it was actually on a camera with film. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel says, thanks for taking my question. I'm a fan of both of you. Thanks. Okay. You hope for your staying safe in Brazil, Daniel. Thanks for your question. Yeah, absolutely. And here's a, here's a kind of cool question. Obviously you have lived in New England for quite a while. Edward Newell asks, question for Lauren, does he think there are Sasquatch on Cape Cod in the islands? Hmm, that's a good one. I've not really heard of any reports. There's actually the Beast of Toro, Toro which is a, a cat, a mystery cat, and I investigated that. Um, then there's the giant squid uh, near there, but uh, uh, I've not heard of them. I think the Sasquatch as a cultural phenomena is in New England, uh, but most of the very best Sasquatch reports, Bigfoot reports from New England, seem to be uh, Wendigo and you know ancient reports, reports from before modern times. So. Yeah, definitely. That that is an interesting case, Bisa Truro. Uh, very fascinating. Here is a pretty good one from David C. Gulliver. What's next for you? Any any adventures upcoming, Lauren? Well, uh, our big adventure right now is, is keeping the museum alive. Um, as you know, we're in the middle of a plague, a pandemic. And one of the things that we had to do on March 20th was close the museum. Uh, and the shuttle, shutting down of the museum uh, it goes from something that was able to pay its rent from month to month to nobody's coming in. It's only through a few uh, online sales of books that we're getting a little bit close to some of the rent. But it's donations and it's sales uh, that is keeping us alive. But I don't know if museums like ours, even ours, will exist past June. And right. so that's, that's my big adventure. I'm, I'm trying to get together uh, a mermaid book to finish. I actually am looking at doing a, uh, finishing up another cryptozoology book. Um, travel's limited. Uh, I have yeah. all kinds of possibility. I was supposed to go to Oregon and meet with some uh, indigenous people out in Oregon. 
and talk to them about some uh, some reports. I was supposed to go to Minnesota and Michigan, um, possibly even to uh, Belgium. There's a big cryptozoology conference over there. So everything's on hold. Uh, and uh, I think it almost feels sad, but uh, the next major adventure may be seeing if it's uh, a good idea to even get on a plane. You know? Because it's dangerous. It's dangerous out there. I'm actually, um, you know, I'm I'm getting up there in years, but I feel very healthy. Except uh, last 9/11, I had a stroke, which completely surprised me and my wife and everybody around me. Uh, it was a luckily it was a one day affair of spending like 23 hours in the ER and finding out that uh, that. Uh, door and sound and different things I was putting in my speech patterns weren't right. Hmm. I came back quickly. But uh, I feel like there's a lot more for me to do uh, in 20, 25 years, 30 more years, and I'll still be out there looking in caves for Yetis. That's fantastic. And and we're, we're so glad that you're, um, you know, feeling better from that. And obviously it was, it was, horrible to hear about that news and and we we pray for the museum as well speaking of that we have a twenty dollar contribution from rachel clovis she asks when you were exploring the bridgewater triangle were there any strange experiences or energies you encountered while you were there i should just mention you coined the term bridgewater triangle so lauren was one of the first people to really be on the scene investigating that as well yeah i am um, i was down there i was uh, working in uh, needham uh, at a boys' home, and was exploring that area. And uh, as far as energies, um, what was interesting to me, I was with a uh, a sensitive woman, social worker, a therapist, and she could not get out of the car because she felt this energy field uh, coming from the power lines in the Bridgewater Triangle, and that uh, I felt there were many people that I would bring in to film. I mean, I was there with the film crew once. Uh, they did all of this filming and they completely lost all of their film. It just, wow. it was a news, uh, news station and they got back to the studio. The camera hadn't got anything, it was all blank. So there was some funny things that would always happen, but uh, the kinds of reports that you know, black dogs and UFOs and Bigfoot, and giant snakes. Uh, it just seemed to be that kind of window area that became a magnet for all this phenomena. And so uh, to hear that some of my psychic friends or, uh, you know, now that other people were interested in the pud wedgies, yeah. and all of that, it's, it's become a, a quite a phenomenon. Uh, believe it or not, I've been approached in the last two weeks by three separate television production companies who wanted to film series there. So I think we haven't heard the last of the Bridgewater Triangle. No, certainly not. I was actually just there the weekend before, a few days actually before Massachusetts declared a state of emergency back in March, filming with um, some friends of mine, Nash Hoover and the Chasing Legends crew in the Triangle. And it was right before the whole crisis sort of started. Oh, I left a bad troll comment about that. I thought you were out breaking the social distancing. <laughs> yeah, I think some of those pictures may have come out afterwards. Right. Um, but but it is a fa it's a fascinating area, and and I think what struck me especially is the history of the cult activity in the Freetown area and the really dark human history there. You know, creatures irregardless. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on there, and uh, or I mean, there's. The satanic stuff going on in Freetown Forest, stuff that a lot of people don't even want to touch. So, no, uh, and for good reason. I mean, it's, some of it is is quite disturbing if you read some of the accounts. Yeah. Um, so here's a good one uh, from Rayfield A. It's got a funny icon there. Have you ever heard of the military sighting of multiple Bigfoot living and dead after the Mount St. Helens eruptions in 1980? It's very fascinating. This is something that I've heard a lot over the years about. Yeah. I think, anyway, he passed away. But before he passed away, he gathered all the reports of uh, people seeing military helicopters coming in 
to uh, Mount St. Helens area. After the eruption, the reports were that they found dead bodies of Bigfoot and uh, they carted them away and they were being hidden in some warehouses and different things like that. He tried to track those down. I tried to track those down. We never could get to the bottom of those. We never could get to uh, find any military people, which was very different from the investigations I did and others have done on the military sightings of uh, rock apes in Vietnam. Uh, you could actually find soldiers to testify on the record that they saw rock apes throwing rocks at some of the soldiers on sentry duty in Vietnam. Whereas the, um, the military rumors that you heard from Mount St. Helens were very interesting, but absolutely we never could get to the bottom of any of those. Yeah, not a lot of substanti substantiation to be made. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, we just talked about that with Ken last week uh, regarding kind of the Minnesota Iceman connection to the rock apes, the Vietnam. I know you obviously researched the Minnesota Iceman and you had um, the replica on display at the museum at the second location, if I remember uh, visiting correctly. So it's definitely an interesting story. Yeah, well, Mark Hall and I were very friendly. We were great friends with Ivan Sanderson and Bernard Heuvelman. So in 1969, we were actually um, asked by Ivan to track down the Minnesota Iceman as it was going around to state fairs. And uh, Mark saw it up in Minnesota. I saw it at the Illinois State Fair. And we, um, we tracked, uh, you know, Frank Hansen. We talked to uh, people that had seen it. We got photographs of it uh, before uh, it was switched, supposedly, or right after it was switched. Sanderson felt there were 14 different structural differences between the actual ice band and the replacement. And right. so, uh, just a couple years ago, we, uh, Paul LeBlanc, uh, up in British Columbia, got hold of uh, Hoiveman's book on the Minnesota Iceman and translated it. And then I did the afterword in which I brought it up to date, in which we uh, tried to figure out that maybe uh, that mystery owner that uh, brought over the, the the real body could have been director Robert Wise, who was doing the movie Sand Pebbles uh, over there. And he was a collector of curiosities, and he may have actually snuck that body back in the country with all his movie equipment. So... Uh, there's lots of interest still in the Minnesota Iceman I'm seeing on Facebook. There's a long discussion with a, a person that doesn't believe it and some other people that are actually open-minded. But, you know, I, I'm just surprised that some of these things that I was very personally involved with kind of 20, 30, 40 years later pop up again and, and they're fresh and new to people. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah, there, there's lots of talk of it. Uh, like I said, just last week, we were getting tons of questions about it. Uh, and it's it's very fascinating. Obviously, at the time, there was a lot of other things being smuggled over from Vietnam, right. as we know. So why not the body of some sort of a creature? I suppose it's something we'll never know as many aspects of the, the sort of the Bigfoot world. Uh, and here's another good question from L.M., L-E-M, excuse me, says, hello, what are Lauren's thoughts on the photo of the Beast of Seven Shoots in Quebec? That's a pretty interesting photo. It's been floating around for quite a while. Yeah, well, I don't think I've seen a good copy of it yet, which is part of the problem with many of these things coming through YouTube or, or the Internet. Uh, so I really don't feel like I can speak to it too well. Absolutely. Here's another one from Crash Course Cryptozoology. Are there any updates on the alleged military Kalinaro footage from West Africa? No, that was the uh, the one of uh, some Navy SEALs had uh, some video of one of these creatures with little spikes and everything. Um, it was one of those things where I heard uh, from people at the time I heard from some of the military people de-identified themselves uh, when I was doing my blog on Crypto Mundo. And yep. uh, 
just disappeared as far as any more interest. I don't know if somebody was told to be quiet or, um, you know, it's it's floating out there. It seemed like the people were still active military. And that's a very dangerous position to, to speak from. If, you know, ex-military gives you some kind of distance, but if you're active military and you're trying to tell about some footage, it usually goes quiet quickly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Rocket Reindeer asks, has Lauren ever visited habituation sites where people say that they visit or sometimes torment families and dogs bang on walls, Sasquatch plus others? Oh, well, yes, somewhat. Um, but not as much as my brother, Jerry, who investigated the Tennessee case in depth. Uh, and here again, uh, the more you investigate, the more is revealed. And um, I, I, please don't take my remarks about the Tennessee case as coloring the whole picture of, of uh, these interactions with the other Bigfoot. But there was a lot of um, use of the Bigfoot stories as a cover for a marijuana trade. Right. Um, and so that was pretty suspicious. The other thing that I've written out about quite a bit in, in the Bigfoot book, actually, is what I call Bigfoot contactees, in which it seems like uh, these contactees, these people have very close interactions with Bigfoot on a one-to-one -one basis, can never come up with any evidence. No footprints, no photographs, no uh, DNA samples, and they're supposedly doing it for emotional, psychological reasons that they want to protect the Bigfoot. So if that's true, why should I or any investigators devote too much energy to these cases? Because if they're going to be cult-like uh, distancing from the evidence, let those people have their interactions. Uh, it doesn't really affect the scientific field of Bigfoot studies. Right. Well, here's a little bit more of a scientific question, I would say, from Daniel in Brazil there. What do you think about the impact of deforestation and home building over Sasquatch habitat and the numbers of this species? Will Sasquatch adapt to a more urbanized environment? Uh, no, a very good question. I feel that uh, um, the... The destruction of habitat destroys the homes of Bigfoot. I mean, it, we know it does with all of their animals. Yeah. It pushes people into deeper wilderness areas, um, pushes all of these species further away. Uh, the thing that um, I find interesting is let's look at the United States map. If you look at the east and see the kinds of Bigfoot cases coming out of the east versus those in the west, you'll, and this is something I've really delved into as far as my thoughts with regard to the aggressiveness of the eastern Bigfoot. If you're limiting the habitat, you're getting more urbanized, you're bringing more dogs into the environment of Bigfoot you're gonna create a more aggressive Bigfoot. Uh, there's more attacks uh, between uh, humans and Bigfoot out east. There's more uh, reports of Bigfoot uh, really having fights with and killing dogs in the east than you hear in the west. In the west, there seems to be more wilderness areas, more trees, more forest for the Bigfoot to occasionally come through the suburbs, occasionally be seen, but then disappear up into the woods. So I think that if you look at this, um, like we already know from Tasmania, that the thylacine habitat was pretty much destroyed. And any kinds of thylacine reports nowadays are much more prevalent in New Guinea and in Western Australia than in Tasmania. So that says a lot about, you only look for cryptids where you can really find them. Right. 
So here's sort of a question uh, pertaining a little bit more to the expedition side of things from David again here. Uh, I'm assuming, did you notice the oddities? Did you notice any oddities when tracking cryptids, weather changes, uh, mechanical failures, optics not working, batteries draining, other high strangeness? I know you've talked a little bit about high strangeness and sort of uh, topics of the, along that nature. Yeah, I, I think that it happened quite a bit in the Bridgewater Triangle. Maybe it wouldn't happen to me, but it would happen to film crews. It would happen to other people um, in, in which we would, I would be reporting or be jotting down all of the, the misadventures that people were having in the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, I don't find that there's uh, strange weather, weather patterns, uh, you know, looking at, uh, alligator reports in strange places or mountain lion reports or mystery cat or Bigfoot. There doesn't seem to be that much Fortean phenomena, but mm. places like the Bridgewater Triangle or other, these windows, these keel kind of reflective places, you do find those. I mean, there was uh, places in North Carolina, places out West uh, where people would find that, it wasn't so much the Bigfoot, it was the area, and then all of the other cases would kind of collect. But uh, I'm always, I've always uh, thought that um, if you send a Bigfoot researcher into an area, uh, oftentimes they ignore the other phenomena. And it's been one of my techniques to be really open minded uh, to collect all of the strange phenomena that's being reported to me. Uh, and I mean, I might be going looking for a Bigfoot and come out with giant turtle reports. To me, that's just as interesting. Uh, or, you know, a UFO report that I'd have to turn over to some of my ufologist buddies. Or uh, now you, days you're seeing, and I think a lot in ghost hunters and, and uh, the paranormal people, where they go in, they start asking, and they they get a lot of different phenomena, and they try to squeeze that round peg into their square hole of this has got to be related to ghosts, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just when people start being open to experiencing otherworldly or other unusual phenomena, they then hear it all, and we have to as researchers hear it from them. Absolutely. What comes to mind when you mention that is uh, the Dover Demon. I think you were one of the first people that investigated that. And if I'm not mistaken, some of the other people that were sort of uh, att attracted to that case at the time were more along the ufological lines. Yes, I, I was the person that first heard about it, first named it. And I decided I was the only cryptozoologist around, you know, and that was 1977, which doesn't seem, I mean, to me, that was long after I'd got interest in cryptozoology, but it was really early in the field. And so I wanted some high caliber researchers. Uh, and I went to APRO, which is the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, and MUFON and NICAP, and got three different researchers to come help me interview all of the people. Because one of the theories floating around, of course, was the Dover Demon was an alien. Yeah. I, did, I, did, I, I was open to anything, but there was no UFO involved. There was It was all by itself. And yet these people were able to uh, ask the right questions. And we, uh, I did the initial investigation before I got these people. And then we all separately interviewed the four eyewitnesses and got a lot of clarity. And then we, in concentric circles, started interviewing all their acquaintances, all of the teachers, all of the uh, law enforcement people connected with it to do a very thorough investigation. And in fact, Walt, Whit um, Walt Webb, the assistant director of the planetarium at the Boston Museum of Science was one of those people. He was a very high caliber guy and it was good to get involved, him involved. 
Yeah, and that's that's such an interesting case, and I, I visited that site, and I actually work pretty close to there, uh, in in the Newton area under normal circumstances. So it's very close to that to Dover. So I think we'll take one more question. Uh, if anyone else has any contributions, last minute contributions they want to put in here, or alternatively in the uh, donation link directly to the museum in the chat, go for it. But we'll do one more question. I think you sort of answered this, but this is a little bit more of a pointed question about. Uh, from Guy15, out of all of your expeditions, have you actually seen or heard the cryptid you were after? Well, most of, most of my best ones have been in Illinois and in the south. And so I've, uh, the little apes in which I found the footprints, the, uh, the, the certain sound that I've heard uh, of the Enfield creature um, and other things like that have been what, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of close Bigfoot experiences and no Mothman, no <laughs> serpents, uh, you know, and different things like that. But uh, it's mostly been the little apes that I've had the, the real eyewitness experiences with, uh, mostly hearing them and finding their traces. And of course, yeah. there's, there's Rask, my little dog back there. <laughs> it's <laughs> so, been hanging out, keeping you company. Been hanging out, being quiet. Uh, That's great. Well, uh, really appreciate I, you coming I want on. To say a thank you to everybody that donated and actually watched and asked questions. I liked all those questions. They were great. Yeah, it was some fantastic questions. I think we topped in around 116 people watching at one point. So um, thank you to everyone who asked questions. We have some people that have been asking questions every single week. Fantastic questions. Uh, and keep them coming, guys. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, next weekend or next week we're having uh, Seth Breedlove on. And we have some other really cool plans for other guests. And um, please, if you can, contribute to the International Cryptozoology Museum because it really is a unique place. Uh, I, you know, I, better. Whenever we're open, I hope they all come visit. Absolutely. It's, if you're into this stuff it's and you're in the Portland, New England area, it's worth the trip up there. I mean, I, I go up there at least once a year and for the conferences and everything. So let's make sure this uh, unique piece of crypto history stays around. So Rocket Reindeer yeah. says thank you. Thank you. Uh, amazing video from Daniel Hernandez. Thank you guys once again, and thank you, Lauren. I uh, really appreciate having you on. And uh, – We'll have to keep in touch then. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Alex. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Be safe.